I try to look at a pretty broad range of tech on my channel. Sometimes I make things, sometimes I reveal things. Sometimes I just show the neat things I've found. So if you come to my channel for 3D printing, well, that week I might be doing CNC and you'll learn a bit about that. Or maybe I program a robot. Other channels offer much more depth on their target subject. I'm kind of a kilometer wide and a centimeter deep. I'm interested in a lot of things, so I like to jump around a lot. Jill of all trades, mistress of none. But I just show the basics, talk about underlying principles. And then if you are interested, you can go down that rabbit hole on another channel. Part of covering so many topics is sometimes I fail to explain things as well as I should. And from looking at the comments on my past videos about security, there are some things I need to explain better. When we talk about information security, penetration testing, everything under that umbrella, we tend to pretty candidly discuss and show what it takes to break security. In general, secrets are good for the manufacturers because they don't have to make their products better and bad for the consumers because they don't know that products are insecure. Criminals are really good at sharing this kind of information with each other and it's in their interest to keep it from, keep it from the public. You don't see by fifths shooting YouTube videos on how easy it is for them to cut certain kinds of locks because they don't want you to know that and buy a better lock. So when you see the lockpicking lawyer or Dwin Olaf demonstrate some exploit, no, they aren't teaching criminals. They are teaching you the potential weak points in your security so you can be safer. Remember the video I did with Kai D and how easily she could break those little hotel locks and get into the room? That's not teaching the bad guys. That's showing women travelers like me those little toys aren't going to protect them and they need something better. And I've heard from a lot of women who did trust those, replicated my tasks and were surprised at how ineffective most of those products are in the real world. Likewise, when I demonstrated how keys can be copied from a photo or locks decoded with a Li Shi tool, this information lets you make better security decisions like not posting pictures of your keys online. Penetration testing is being a good bad guy. It's showing people how the bad guys or girls can do it. So they can keep that from happening. No, it's if you just don't tell anyone, the problem doesn't magically go away. So please in the comments, ease up with the, you're teaching people to commit crime. No, what we are doing is teaching people how to make better security choices so criminals don't exploit their ignorance and victimize them. Now, every pen tester has their own favorite methods. Lockpicking lawyer is a world-class lockpicker who can take the toughest locks in the world head on. Dewey and Olaf can pick locks, but often relies on an amazing variety of bypass tools and tricks for side channel attacks. My own preference is evil may attacks and privilege escalation. Because I me, mean, I can usually get in most offices just by walking past security or looking appropriately desperate to use the bathroom. I'm a bit much, so people kind of just don't want to deal with me. What? Technically speaking, I exploit a form of what's called inattentional brightness. There's a link that explains it in the description box. It's why in so many of my videos, even though I look kind of crazy, most people just ignored it. So often I can just walk straight through whatever sort of check-in setup they have. 
It's a real life version of what Douglas Adams called the someone else's problem view. You cannot fit to an extent that people's brains kind of just don't want to do. For those of you who can pull that off, the hard hat and high visibility vest is a classic. Once you have basic access, let's call it user level access. What do you do with that? You look for a means to raise your access privileges. I can pick the high security cylinder on the server room door, but I can pick the chip lock on the key cabinet or the desk drawer where the spare keys to the server room are kept. Because there are always spare keys somewhere and usually in very predictable places. This is just an example of privilege escalation as an attack, not necessarily a blueprint. Don't blame me if you try this and get arrested. I have a few tricks up my sleeve that make it work for me. My strategy means I don't focus on developing very advanced lock picking skills. I focus on being able to open trip locks very fast with very portable tools I can keep with me at all times, like this. And like some people get very good at guessing passwords, I've gotten very good at finding the chip locks that got the keys to the good locks. Honestly, people are never very clever about where they keep spare keys. It's even worse than passwords. 90% of the time, they are in one of three places and they're never ever behind a lock more secure than the keys they contain. One kind of low security lock that makes a good target is RFID locks. You can often bypass the mechanical lock itself, but if you are able to get access to a tag, you can also clone it. This is useful because the act of being seen using a tag establishes that you belong in a certain place. It's a sort of credential something you can often leverage to get a system gaining additional access. So while writing someone else's tag in through an open door often works, it's an old trick. People will call you on it, and it's hard to escalate that to greater access the way that having and being seen using your own tag can. If we can get momentary access to someone else, someone's RFID tag, and there are a lot of ways to social engineering that we can talk about in the future. We want to copy it. Then I can hold the door and allow someone else to write my clone tab past the first reader, make a little small talk, and rely on their urge to reciprocate and let me write that credential for the next higher level reader. After all, I've already established that I belong there. There's a ton of different RFID technologies and almost as many ways to exploit them. And I'm not going to break that all down for you today. I will post links to that information in the description. What I'm going to cover is the very broad strokes of how we clone those tags and what sort of hardware we can use. These are two common latches that I'm going to use for the demo. Both of them are quite common on professional installations, but they are also very useful for DIY projects because they are easier to install than traditional locks for mechanical keyways. One is this depot for doors. The other is a lightweight cabinet lock. This kind is often used on gym and spa lockers. Lockers are a great starting point, low security, and they give you access to clone everything the target's got. Tags, cards, uh, mechanical keys, photo ID, you get everything. So first, let's take a look at what tools we have. This is the industry standard and probably the overall most powerful RFID cracking tool, the Proxima 3. Real ones are a bit over $300, so a pretty substantial investment if you just want to play around a bit. 
It also means you have a pretty strong incentive not to ditch the evidence in the trash like you can with cheaper units. There are a ton of Proxmark tutorials on YouTube, so I'm going to skip that today and focus on lower cost Chinese cloning tools. I'll try to provide links in the description box, but those tend to change a lot and if they do, I can help you. This video is about reviewing a class of tools. You may have to find those tools on your own. Okay, let me show you what I've got. These are a bunch of RFID weeder I got from Taobao. They're pretty cheap. Um, let me open it and show it to you. So this one is NFC Pro. Uh, you can directly connect it to your phone and use the app there to read the data off from the IC or ID tag. And these are the free samples that comes with it. This is the CUID tag. This is the ICCUID sticker. And what we have here is the NFC PM Pro. This one works with the laptop instead of the phone. It has, it has its own software and uh, it can read off uh, high frequency or low frequency or uh, detect a variety of uh, different tags. Like this one is IDA218. This is the ID tag. This is not IC tag. This is just the uh, same as the other, the other ones. This is the IC CUID. And it can also read off the ID8218 sticker. I am going to show it to you later. Uh, and what else? Oh, and this one. This one is a multi button one. So if you use the NFC PM Pro, you can read off the data from the other text and then store it one by one here. And then you just push the button to open or unlock something. It's it, this is pretty cool. Okay, first let me show you how the NFC Pro works. So turn it on. You can also just press the button read and write. Like when you try to decode something, you just press this two button. But now we are going in the app. Okay. device initial successful. Okay, this is the tag I used to open this lock. Let's decode that. It should be very fast because it's non-encrypted. Now it's reading it off. Okay, you can save the file. It will automatically save to the folder. And then since we have that data, we are going to copy it, we are going to use another tag. These tag have different data as this one. This come out from the manufacturer. Okay, let's just write that. All right. And in this bag, we also have the ICCU ID sticker. I'm going to demo that also. Let's also write the data in the sticker. Okay, now let's turn that off. Both of these two have the same data as this one. Let's lock our door. Okay. First, let's try the UID tag. All right. And then let's try the ICC UID sticker. Book worked. Great. So the last one is this NFC, NFC PM Pro. I need to connect it with my laptop. I am going upstairs to bring it down and demo it to you. This video is made possible by the generous support of JLC PCB, China's largest PCB manufacturer. With JLC, you can have your PCB manufactured in under 24 hours. 
or while you track the process in real time. Prototype boards start at just $2 in any color. Check the description box for more info. One of the best ways to support me is to support the companies that fund this channel. Okay, now I've connected the IFID reader to my laptop by USB cable and I opened the, their software end of CPM Pro version 2.2. In here, you can see it can detect low frequency car, high frequency car, and it can detect uh, other varieties of the IFID tech. Now I'm going to demo it with the uh, cabinet lock. This is the uh, ID tech I used to unlock it. So ID car is successfully and in this bag, I have the ID sticker and I have the ID tag. I can use both. I can copy it to here or there. When the, the data already being saved, you don't need to uh, save it additionally to your folder. So the data has been written in the tag and now the sticker. Both has the data of the ID tag to unlock the cabinet lock. Let's try that. Let's put the lock in. Okay, now it is locked. Let's try the ID sticker first. Next, let's try the tag. All right. Both works. Great. And then the yeah, other's just the same like the other one, so I'm not going to demo that. And we remember we have this multi button one. Let's place it on here. And let's go to high frequency. You have to keep holding the button. So now these are the data. We can choose to save the data and then write it, or we can just write it directly. So since we already have this IC card data, I'm just going to put one of the UID tag there and then write it. IC card written successfully. So now this one holds one of the uh, uh, data of the button C and since this one have, have the same data as this one and if we want put it back and hold button C I see car written successfully so you can do it both ways you can copy the data from the UID car or and then you can unlock your door or uh, other stuff with with uh, this control, it's pretty neat. Okay, last word. This is just the very broad strokes of how RFID coin works. I'll provide links to videos that go into more detail in the description box. All this should give you a little pause if you are in the habit of sharing or providing gets with tags to use temporarily and then having them give those tags back access control systems where you can get alerts for unauthorized attempts or you can disable any given text access can prevent a lot of these problems as can using a combination of a tag and biometrics or a pin code although of course it's a lot of fun to come up with ways to circumvent those measures also and if you are good at it you might have a career as a pen tester in your future. That's it for today. I hope you like this little videos on security. I think everyone should be aware of these issues so they can keep themselves and their loved ones safe. Until next time, if I can do it, anyone can do it.